today's general membership meeting of the Management Association of the Philippines. Today, we will also have the much eagerly awaited annual economic briefing. My name is Malu Cristobal, and I'm today's MC. We're still on virtual meetings, so please settle down comfortably, whatever you may be. As a fitting start uh, to our program, I would like to request everyone to join me in a short prayer. Almost merciful God, we come to you in our weakness. We come to you in our fear. We come to you with trust, for you alone are our hope. We place before you the disease present in our world. We turn to you in our time of need. Bring wisdom to doctors. Give understanding to scientists. Endow caregivers with compassion and generosity. Bring healing to those who are ill. Protect those who are most at risk. Give comfort to those who have lost a loved one. Welcome those who have died into your eternal home. Stabilize our communities. Unite us in our compassion. Remove all fear from our hearts. Fill us with confidence in your care. Amen. Let us now join in the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Now request our new president, who is lead independent director of SM Investments Corporation, Mr. Fred Pasqual, to deliver his welcome remarks. President Fred. Thank you, Malu. Our guest speakers, Secretary Carl Chua, Dr. Shell Habito, and Dr. Rong Chen, our distinguished guests from the government, diplomatic circle, academia, and media, our board of governors, fellow MAP members, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this MAP general membership meeting and economic briefing on behalf of the MAP board of governors. In today's economic briefing, we will hear three perspectives on the country's economic performance for 2021, and more importantly, the country's outlook for 2022 and beyond. We are fortunate to have one economist from the cabinet's economic cluster, our own economist from the private sector, and one international economist from the World Bank. We always hold this MAP economic briefing in the early part of each year so that our members can sharpen their work, their forecasting tools for better business decisions. Briefings such as this provide an excellent opportunity for us to become more informed about the country's economic prospects 
and learn how to respond to the emerging opportunities and challenges we will undoubtedly face. Our MAP theme for 2022, as you all know, is push for change towards a better future for all, as I have articulated earlier. In keeping with this theme, we are focusing on three major thrusts for 2022. One, policy reform for economic dynamism. Two, human development and well-being. And three, shared prosperity and sustainability. Let me now report briefly on how we are progressing in pursuit of these three thematic thrusts. In support of our main thrust, the first main thrust of policy reform for economic dynamism, MAP has so far issued the following public statements. First, on January 6, 2022, we issued a statement commending Miralco's EDSA greening project. Two, on January 10, 2022, we made a public statement expressing concern about the negative impact on business of reimposing blanket lockdowns amid the record-breaking surge in new COVID-19 cases. Three, on January 21, we led four organizations in signing a joint statement urging the Senate to ratify RCEP, or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And fourth, on January 28, we co-signed with various business and civic organizations a joint letter to COMELEC seeking dialogue to ensure that contingency measures are in place to allow elections under extreme health emergency conditions and other concerns. The dialogue took place on Monday, February 7, and yielded satisfactory results. We also agreed to accept the invitation for MAP to join an academia and civil society coalition for voters' education. The coalition intends to hold presidential forums and debates. As I stated in my inaugural address, we will put together an agenda of policy imperatives that we will push to accelerate recovery and sustain uh, the, the economy. Furthermore, we will advocate for good governance and the rule of law in implementing policies by relevant public offices. This morning, our A MAP board met with the various chairs and vice chairs of the MAP committees to listen to their plans and programs for 2022. We have requested these committees along with the others to each come up with a list of up to five of their priority policy imperatives. The prioritized policies will enable the various economic sectors to flourish and contribute fully to sustaining our economy's recovery and further development. We anticipate that the committees will remain vigilant and monitor developments in their respective sectors while conducting studies on policy agendas intended to they intend to pursue with their counterparts in the government. By mid-2022, we will invite newly elected and appointed national government officials for policy dialogues. For the second main thrust on human development and well-being, we are starting the year with two significant projects. The first project is the Agri-Aqua Innovation Challenge, a 10-month national competition of startups and students. Its goal is to help students turn their technological ideas into actual products and services that will benefit farmers, fisher fox, and the rest of our population. This project will be a tripartite undertaking of the Department of Science and Technology, the Asian Institute of Management, and the MAP. To kick off the project, we are going to sign today at this meeting a Memorandum of Understanding and Cooperation. In this government academic industry partnership, 
MEP's primary role is to provide mentors and sponsors to the competing teams. Our Human and Management Development Committee will lead MAP's involvement in the project in collaboration with our Agribusiness Committee and our Next Gen Committee. By Next Gen Committee, of course, you know, we mean members or MAP members below the age of 50. The second project is the second edition of the SGV MAP Next Gen CEO Transformative Leadership Program. We will circulate the details of this program within the next couple of weeks, consistent with SGV's purpose to nurture leaders and enable businesses for a better Philippines. This 12-month interactive leadership program is geared towards helping high-performing young CEOs and hopefuls reframe the future of their respective companies. The program is anchored on four main themes, leading with purpose, humans at center, technology at speed, and innovation at scale. Like in the first round last year of this program, it will accommodate 15 MAP Next Gen members who will participate in the said transformative leadership program for free. Aside from these two uh, initial projects, we are partnering with PIBED, the Philippine Business for Education to hold a joint general membership meeting on April 7 to discuss the challenges in our basic education sector and explore solutions. For the third main thrust on shared prosperity and sustainability, we are also signing today the De La Salle University MAP Memorandum of Agreement on De La Salle's participation as MAP's academic partner for promoting the covenant for shared prosperity. As you may recall, MAP led 26 business organizations to sign this covenant for shared prosperity on November 5, 2020. This covenant covers business commitments to environmental sustainability, social justice, good governance and stakeholders' interests, particularly employees, customers, suppliers, communities, and shareholders. Through the Ramon V. De Rosario College of Business, the De La Salle University agreed to teach the covenant to all business students and participants in professional development courses by incorporating it in all business programs and course syllabi, and ensuring that all faculty members discuss the covenant in relation to their respective academic and professional development courses, while integrating covenant principles in course assessment requirements. At our end, MAP will do the following, among others, promote understanding of and commitment to the covenant among the MAP members support DLSU's covenant activities through recommended speakers and support DLSU's research and recognition activities concerning the covenant. We are also partnering again with DLSU, but this time with their animal labs in assessing the covenant's progress and the signatories implementation of their commitments. We also hope to bring these commitments to a broader range of companies, including MSMEs in addition to large corporations. The DLSU Animal Labs will help us look into how environmental, social, and governance or ESG metrics can support the governance operationalization. MAP also joined recently the Philippine chapter of ARISE, which is led by the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. ARISE is a network of private sector entities whose members voluntarily commit to support and implement disaster risk management strategies that ultimately reduce mortality, 
affected people, economic losses, and damages to critical infrastructure due to disasters. We agree with Arise that to strengthen the resilience of our communities, we need to come up with effective disaster risk management strategies that consider the sensitivities and realities on the ground. At this point, I would like to convey MAP's congratulations to the Department of Transportation Secretary Arthur Tugade for the 47 million ridership attained by the new EDSA busway in 2021. The success of this initiative has provided great relief to long suffering bus commuters while helping decongest traffic on EDSA. The ridership milestone proves the concept of the busway solution advocated in the MAP general membership meeting held on August 6, 2015 by then chairman of the MAP Traffic and Transportation Committee, Eddie Up, during the term of MAP President Popoy de Rosario. It took five years of persistent efforts, but it paid off when it was implemented by Secretary Together on June 1st, 2020. The success story of this MAP advocacy demonstrates the value of private sector engagement with the government. Indeed, MAP can be a positive force in finding solutions to public concerns that deliver positive socioeconomic impacts. Thus, before I end, I encourage our members to participate in various MAP activities through our various committees. Keep yourself updated on our programs and projects by regularly checking your emails, Viber inboxes, and the MAP website. The MAP memo, our weekly electronic newsletter sent to all members via email provides a wealth of information about our events and other undertakings. Thank you. Keep yourself safe and healthy. Very much, President Fred. That was quite a bit of achievement given the a month of your uh, of your tenure. So we do look forward to the next eleven. We will now proceed with the online induction of our new members. And to do the honors, we have and I'd like to call in the chair of our membership committee, our immediate past president, and the chair of Far Eastern University, Gigi Montinola. Afternoon. I am pleased to announce that this afternoon we will be inducting five new MAP members who will increase our total membership from 1067 to 1072. May I now read the names of our inductees? The first inductee will be Mr. Hans Voltaire, Hans R. Bayaborda, President and CEO, Asia Select Inc line of business, human capital solutions, sponsors, Mr. Alexander Henil and Ms. Janet Sulueta. Next name, please. The next name is Mr. Francisco Pancho Del Mundo, the CFO of Universal Robina Corporation, line of business manufacture and distribution of consumer food products. Sponsors are Mr. Alfredo Pascual and Mr. Aurelio Montinola. Our third name is Dr. Raul V. Destura, founder and CEO of Manila Health Tech Inc. Line of business, diagnostic technologies for communicable and non-communicable diseases, clinical services in molecular diagnostics. Sponsors are Mr. John Alan Vinta, and Professor Matthew George Escobedo. Our fourth name is Attorney John Peter Ferdinand Ferdi Echeverri, Head of Stakeholder Relations and Global Communications for PMFTC Inc. Line of Business, 
manufacture of agricultural and consumer products. Sponsors are Attorney Francisco Lim and Ms. Rizalina Mantaring. And our fifth uh, nominee uh, or inductee is Mr. Manuel Louis uh, Ferrer, the Vice Chair of Megawide Construction Corporation. The line of business is engineering and infrastructure. The sponsors are Mr. Alfredo Pascual and Mr. Aurelio Montinola III. May I now turn over to our president, um, Fred? Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. May I request the inductees to please raise the right hand and repeat after me. I state your Aye. name. Aye. I, John Peter Ferdinand S. Echeverri. Do hereby solemnly pledge. Do hereby solemnly pledge. That I will perform well and faithfully. I will perform, perform well, well and faithfully, faithfully. To the best of my ability. To the best, the best of, my ability. of my ability. My duties as a regular member. Duties as a regular member. As a regular member. member. In order to contribute, in order to contribute, order to contribute to the achievement of the objectives, to the achievement, to the achievement of the objectives, of the management association of the Philippines, the management association of the Philippines. So help me God. So help, so help, so help me God. God. Congratulations and welcome to MAP. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. President Fred. Thank you, GG. And congratulations to our new members. Let us all welcome them with a warm round of, well, virtual applause. Okay, at this point, uh, we will have two special segments in our meeting. Uh, these were already partly covered in the welcome remarks of our president. Let me start with the first one. And this is the signing of the De La Salle University Management Association of the Philippines Memorandum of Agreement on the LSU's participation as MAP's academic partner for the Covenant for, Prosper for Shared Prosperity. Uh, what I'd like to do now is ask the signatories and the witnesses to turn on their videos, uh, as I call their names. Representing MAP is our very own president, Fred Pasquale. And representing the LSU is its president, Brother Bernard Oka, FSC. Witnessing the signing are MAP ESG Committee Chair, Popoy Del Rosario, the LSU Ramon V. Del Rosario College of Business Dean, Dr. Emilina Sarial, and representing both MAP and the LSU, Benty Hanke. We will now have a photo op for the signatories and witnesses. What I'd like to request you to do upon the request of our secretariat is to please hold on to your copies of the MOA. Make sure that it is across or over your chest. And within the next 30 seconds, the secretariat will um, take a screenshot of, of all oh, of you. My copy is in electronic form. You know? <laughs> so maybe another sheet of paper. <laughs> For for yes, photo like purposes, it. I'm sure the you know the legal document uh, will be uh, has been signed or will be rooted for signing shortly. So as the secretary is taking your photos, I mentioned that through this MOA, the LSU through the Ramon V. Del Rosario College of Business commits to teach the covenant to all business students and participants in professional development courses by incorporating it in all business programs and core syllabi and ensuring that all faculty discuss the covenant in relation to their respective academic and professional development courses. Uh, has the photo been taken so that our- Okay, please. Is, is it good? One, two, three, including you, Malu, please. Another oh, okay. one, please. One, two, three. Thank you. Okay, and on MAP side, MAP commits to in turn to promote the covenant among its members and support the LSU's activities in relation to the covenant 
among others. So let me thank Brother Bernie, President Fred, Dean Serial, uh, Popoy, and Ben uh, for, for, for this afternoon's uh, signing or photo op. And we look forward to the active implementation of this partnership. Thank, thank you, you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now Thank have the second um, acknowledgement of the partnership. And this time it is a tripartite partnership among uh, the Asian Institute of Management, the Department of Science and Technology, uh, PCAARRD or PICARD, and the Management Association of the Philippines Memorandum of Understanding and Cooperation on the Agri Aqua innovation challenge. Again, I'd like to ask the signatories and the witnesses to turn on your videos. Uh, signatories are from AIM side, Professor Alberto Mateo, head of the School of Executive Education and Lifelong Learning. From AMMAP side, we have, we're getting back in, uh, our president, Fred Pascual, and from the DOST side, we have Dr. Reynaldo Ebora. Witnessing the signing are Ms. Grace Sablaya Reynoso for AIM, Professor Matthew Escobedo for MAP, and Mr. Noel Katibog for DOSTP card. Again, as we did previously, please make sure that your copies of the MOA is visible in your video across your chest, and within 30 seconds, the secretariat will take the screenshots. As the photo op is being done, let me mention that this partnership hopes to create a platform where industry, academe, and the government work together to further our national development by supporting startups and empowering student teams to translate their technologies into products and services that will benefit the Filipinos. So, uh, Arnold? Malo, including you, please. Oh. One, okay. two, three. Another one, please. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. on Thank MAP you, side, Thank you. Thank you. on MAP partners. side, let me mention that MAP is expected to make That's some of its members available Lasal, this one. to serve as judges in screening the deserving applicants, in mentoring the participants, and in promoting the startup products to the MAP membership and their network. So a lot of work is ahead of MAP as well as its partners, AIM and DOST. So thank you, Professor Mateo, President Fred, Dr. Ebora, Matthew, um, Ms. Reynoso, and uh, Mr. Katibo. And again, we do look forward to a fruitful partnership among business, government, and the academe. Okay, thank you again. We now move on to the highlight of this event which is our economic briefing. A lot of questions must be in everybody's mind. Are we facing the end of the era of cheap money, low interest rates? Can the various central banks find that right balance between taming inflation, which is turning out to be more persistent rather than transitory, and keeping the economies on a growth path? How will the new president bring our economy back to sustainable health? And what kind of macroeconomic numbers can we expect in the next 12 to 24 months? Lucky for us, we have top-notch economists to give us their valuable insights on the Philippine and world economies, and an excellent moderator who I am certain will home in on the hot button issues. So we are really in for a very exciting afternoon. But before I call on our uh, speakers, just uh, a reminder to our participants, you have been muted and your cameras and videos have been disabled, but we do encourage you to participate in the open forum. Please uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box and not on the chat box so that our moderator can just look at one uh, particular box. And time permitting, our moderator will uh, be able to ask all of your questions. As a gentle reminder to our speakers, you have been allotted a maximum 
of 15 minutes for your respective presentations. I will be turning off my video, but when you see me back on screen, that means you have about 30 seconds to do your wrap up. Okay, in line with the MAP's policy and in the interest of time, and also because you're all well known to our attendees, we will dispense with giving our speakers lengthy introduction. I understand that their CVs, you know, they are flashed on screen, but if you do want copies of their CVs, I'm sure we can make arrangements uh, with the secretariat for that. So let me now call on our first speaker in arguably the best looking of the cabinet secretaries, our socioeconomic planning secretary, Carl Kendrick Chua. Good afternoon to the Management Association of the Philippines, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very important forum. The presentation is about revving up towards a full recovery in 2022. Let me try to cover three important topics, and these are also the high-level priorities for 2022 and beyond. I will uh, spend a bit more time on the first, uh, a bit uh, less on the second, and just give a general idea of the third, and maybe reserve the third, which is mitigating and adapting to climate change uh, for a future topic. But for me, I think these are the most important high-level priorities that the administration and the next uh, should focus on. The first is recovering from COVID-19. The second is raising productivity, and this is very important if we want to sustain our growth as a high or upper middle income country towards high income country. And the third is the mitigating and adapting to climate change. So let me first give an overview of the recent developments. As you all know, the Philippine economy grew by 5.6% in 2021, and this is above expectations. As you can see, prior to the pandemic, we were uh, recording around 6% average growth for the four years prior to the pandemic. Because of the pandemic and our stringent quarantines, growth fell to as low as minus 17%, but we gradually improved our growth, uh, quarterly growth. And in the last three quarters, we registered positive growths. And for the full year, the average is 5.6%. On a seasonally adjusted quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, the economy continued to expand despite several surges of the COVID-19. Uh, notably, in the second quarter, we saw the recurrence of uh, COVID, uh, which uh, led us to impose the ECQ again. We also did that in the third quarter, but notice that despite that, we recorded positive year-on-year -year growth and positive quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth. And this is because of our effective risk management uh, as uh, opposed to what we did in the year 2020. The strong 2021 performance attests to our correct risk management strategy. Uh, basically, what we did was to move away from stringent quarantines to more targeted ones and manage the risk by focusing on the uh, closed spaces, the crowds, and the closed contacts and using granular lockdowns. And that allowed us to achieve a 5.6% GDP growth that was above an adjusted target uh, of 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 uh, for 2021. And I believe the stage is now set forth uh, for us to grow and accelerate to 7 to 9% in 2022. Despite the uh, setback of the Omicron variant in the first month of this year, we have seen the virus uh, go away fast and we were able to manage the risk and see a more uh, responsive uh, or more open economy uh, in the latter part of January. At the same time, job indicators are closer to pre-pandemic levels as we open the economy and manage risk despite the spikes. The target that we are uh, trying to achieve is to get to unemployment rate of below 5%. 
uh, prior to the pandemic, we were at 5.3% unemployment rate. This went up to as high as 17.6%. Uh, that is the red line that you see. But in 2021, because of our more uh, risk managed approach and our opening of the economy further, we were able to gradually bring down the unemployment rate uh, to 6.5% in November, which is the latest data. We also started around uh, uh, in last year to uh, record unemployment on a monthly basis. And this is our way of making sure that we can uh, get uh, data faster and adjust policy even faster. And so uh, in the end, what we saw is a uh, 2.9 million more employed Filipinos compared to the pre-pandemic level. So this is uh, a very good sign that the uh, job indicators are responding to our opening of the economy. However, we saw an increase in the poverty rate. The poverty rate among the population expectedly, as expected, increased in the first half of 2021. Um, recall that in 2015, the poverty rate was 26.3% for the first half of that year. And by the second, by 2018, first half, it went down to 21.1%. And because of the pandemic and the quarantines we imposed, it uh, slightly went up to 23.7%. Uh, but we expect that this will improve significantly in the second half of 2021 due to our better growth outcomes. So um, in a nutshell, this is the economic and social situation in 2021. To address our present uh, need to accelerate and sustain economic recovery, the Economic Development Cluster of Cabinet has proposed to the President a 10-point policy. And let me just go over this uh, quickly. I've, I'm sure you have seen a fuller presentation uh, uh, in the past. So in the final months of the Duterte administration, we will vigorously pursue the economy's full recovery to restore jobs and bring more people out of poverty. There are 10 items. The first is on metrics, then vaccination, then the healthcare capacity. And then uh, number four is the economy and mobility. Number five, uh, very important, is schooling. Uh, six and seven are domestic and international travel. Then we have digital transformation. Number nine is a pandemic flexibility bill that we need in case of a future pandemic. And number 10 is our medium term preparation for pandemic resilience. Uh, in the succeeding slides, I will just highlight a few of the ideas just to uh, remind all of you of what this uh, 10 point policy is about. As we move from a pandemic to a more endemic uh, paradigm, we have to, I think, begin with changing our metrics when we make decisions. So currently, we are still focused on total cases. We propose that uh, as more people get vaccinated, as this uh, virus becomes more endemic, we shift to uh, monitoring total uh, severe or critical cases. In other words, those that require hospitalization. Instead of total deaths, uh, we look at case fatality ratio and we continue to monitor those who are totally vaccinated. This is important so that uh, the rise in case need not lead to an ECQ or alert level four or five. And in January of this year, we had a natural experiment when uh, we saw that the cases did increase significantly, but we did not move beyond alert level three because the total severe and critical cases were very well uh, uh, manageable. The second is to pursue our vaccination drive. As of uh, the 29th of January, we have uh, administered 126 million doses, where, uh, of which 58 million have gotten their full dose and 7 million their booster dose. Next, uh, this week actually, we are uh, starting the vaccination of children uh, 5 to 11. So that is a very good uh, development and we should pursue this uh, so that schools may open. On healthcare capacity, we have increased total COVID dedicated beds uh, by sevenfold, uh, but occupancy rate has really declined and is currently at 44%. And we saw this in NCR in January, 
uh, while cases were uh, at historic highs, our hospital capacity uh, were more than enough. Uh, in fact, we did not even exceed 70% to warrant an increase in the alert level uh, beyond alert level three. So we will continue, uh, I think, to uh, expand this to make sure that we are ready all the time to care for the very sick people from COVID-19. Number four is basically, as I mentioned, opening of the economy and public transportation. And we have done this uh, simple uh, chart wherein every week that we move from one alert level to another, we incur a loss or a gain. So for instance, by moving from alert level three to alert level two, we have uh, added to the economy three billion uh, pesos per week to the NCR plus uh, area and we have reduced the unemployment rate or number of people who are unemployed by 51,000. And if we continue to work together and see alert level one, hopefully by, uh, by the next month, then we would have added 11.2 billion pesos in gross value added per week in the NCR plus area and uh, reduce the number of unemployed by 191,000. So uh, fortunately, uh, we did not see the need to shift to alert level four, which would be uh, very bad for the uh, economy in 2022. Number five is uh, the opening of our face-to-face uh, -face schooling. Before the start of the pilot face-to-face -face classes last November, the Philippines was the only country in the region to have closed school, face-to-face uh, -face schooling for more than a year. And uh, this is something uh, we want to uh, reverse very soon, especially as more kids get vaccinated. Uh, we have also estimated the significant decline in productivity of around 11 trillion peso for every year that face-to-face uh, -face schooling does not happen. And we do not want this uh, school year to end with zero face-to-face -face schooling. Uh, in many countries in the region and in other countries that we monitor, uh, the schools are finding ways to reopen for in-person learning. So this uh, chart shows you the various uh, characteristics of uh, how they pursue their face-to-face -face, uh, school opening. And our thinking in NEDA is uh, we will not get it uh, right at the, f at the start, but it is crucial to pilot immediately more schools so that we learn uh, from the pilot. And the more we pilot, the more we will learn, the more we can get it right. But if we don't pilot or we limit the pilot or we uh, don't uh, pursue this, then we will never get it started. Number six is uh, on uh, domestic travel. We can safely boost domestic travel by minimizing and harmonizing travel requirements. In the past, or up to today, there are many passes. Uh, once I went to Mindanao and I had to prepare seven passes. Uh, what we propose are basically two, the vaccination certificate and a single QR code that is interoperable or interscannable. And I hope we will get to that uh, soon. On number seven, international travel. Recently, uh, we had restrictions on uh, who can enter the country and we also had a uh, quota on daily flights but uh, we're very pleased that we are now moving away from that in fact the IATF rules are now to forego quarantine for vaccinated passengers and to remove the uh, uh, color coding of countries and to uh, hopefully eventually remove uh, flight or passenger daily quota that will help in, uh, in the recovery of international travel. Number eight is the acceleration of digital transformation, especially important if there is another pandemic. We are very happy to note that the Public Services Act amendment was already uh, ratified by Congress and would soon be enrolled and uh, would only need the president's signature. Uh, apart from that, we think we should uh, fully implement a number of laws uh, or regulations that would allow more uh, access to digital technology and there are several more bills that we think should be enacted to further enhance our digital transformation. Number nine is the enactment of a pandemic flexibility bill. 
so that we do not need to go to Congress for another Bainihan 3 or 4 or 5 when a pandemic strikes us. This is similar to the NDRRMC law, uh, so that we are better prepared for future public health emergencies, so that we have budget flexibility, uh, we can relax data privacy, we can use electronic transactions, and our national and local government would have more aligned policy and we would be more prepared, for instance, with a medical reserve core. And finally, number 10, on the medium term, is a pandemic uh, playbook uh, that would uh, help us prepare, uh, taking stocks of lessons learned, uh, prevent pandemics by uh, uh, implementing a more healthy lifestyle, and to mitigate the impact of future pandemics uh, by further strengthening our social protection system. And the national ID, which has registered, uh, I think, uh, close to 55 million, is uh, one important step towards uh, that transformation. So these are, uh, in summary, uh, the 10-point policy to accelerate and to sustain our economic recovery in 2022 and onwards. And many of these have been implemented and we need to do more and sustain if we are to achieve our 7 to 9% target, uh, growth target uh, this year. Let me now end with four top priorities of NEDA that I see are very important. Uh, we are preparing the foundation for this and I hope the next administration would continue the work. And we are thinking about how we can improve productivity uh, over the medium term, and we think that uh, we need to focus on a number of uh, important uh, thematics. Uh, the first is smarter infrastructure. We have uh, built a lot of infrastructure, but I think uh, they can be smarter. In other words, more connected, uh, more in line with urban planning, with urbanization, uh, networks that actually work, uh, that actually uh, improve the, the travel and experience or condition of the people instead of having many of our countrymen falling in line and wasting hours trying to connect from the MRT to the bus to the jeep and so on. Uh, we also have to bear in mind that uh, more roads are not necessarily good if they will just produce more emission. So uh, in the coming uh, months, we are going to propose, uh, for instance, in NED, uh, a policy on having a more coordinated master planning. The second is regional equity. We realize that uh, while we have many projects, uh, there is a lot of inequality. Uh, there are regions or provinces that badly need projects, uh, whether it be tel in telecoms, water, sanitation, uh, but hardly get it. So we are proposing a way to have more equity in the allocation of the budget for infrastructure uh, based on a more objective assessment, uh, not only based on how well a region or a province or our uh, politicians uh, fight or lobby for the projects. And an important element of this is to create a single uh, unique project ID for all projects, whether they are emanating from the national government the Regional Development Council, or the local government. So we can monitor projects from identification to completion to evaluation. The third is innovation. Uh, we have a Philippine Innovation Act, and I believe this is uh, very crucial in uh, paving the way towards our bid to become an upper middle income country, hopefully with, by this year and to uh, graduate to high income country status in one generation. So instead of just copying uh, new ideas or research and development done in other countries and assembling them here, we would like to pursue uh, having those new ideas, new products, new ways of doing things in the Philippines. And this need not be in high technology. I think uh, they should be also in basic sectors like agriculture and in availing of basic services uh, uh, for the people. And finally, is the issue on uh, mitigating and adapting to climate change. This is a very important topic. Uh, in fact, I have proposed that uh, the NEDA, together with the other agencies, work together to ensure that the, or to pro propose that the next Philippine Development Plan would have climate change as the uh, core of our development planning. 
and whether uh, and all other sectors, uh, whether it be in agriculture, infrastructure, energy, uh, would uh, uh, evolve policies that are fully supportive of our goal to uh, mitigate or adapt to the impact of climate change. So these are some of the uh, important priorities that uh, we in NEDA think should form the foundation of the next administration uh, so that we can further accelerate and sustain growth after we address the COVID-19 pandemic threat. Uh, with that, thank you very much. I look forward to your questions later. Thank you very much, Secretary Carl. We'll have you back for the Q&A later. Let me now call on our second speaker, our very own MAP Governor, Chair of Brain Trust, and Professor of Ateneo de Manila University, Dr. Shell Abita. Dr. Shell. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Marilu. And uh, again, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to again be uh, asked to uh, give this economic briefing. And let me share with you some of my own perspectives. And given the limited time, I will have to be somewhat selective. But uh, here, let me just show you. I'm talking about three major things. First, the fact that it has been a changed economy after COVID. Second, I'll talk about three key directions. And I, I, I know there are more that I could, and I would want to mention, but again, uh, I would have to just mention those that I have some direct involvement in, especially the last two. And third, I'll call them fearful forecasts, mainly because nobody can really forecast with any degree of certainty at this time, as we all know. Well, let me first start with my usual pithic test, or precio trabajo kita, being the major yardsticks of our uh, economic performance. Uh, first, of course, precio. And by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll reintroduce our audience to my usual color coding. As an Ateneo professor, good news is in blue and bad news is in well, one of our agreement partners earlier. Sorry about that. Uh, prices have still remained uh, you know, rather elevated in the rate of increase. We ended up, of course, with a rate of inflation that was higher than usual, 4.5% uh, versus 26 last year. Trabajo is also green, unfortunately, mainly because unemployment remains elevated from where it was before the pandemic, which is already even getting below 5%, but it was elevated at almost 11% in 2020 and still is uh, averaging 7.9% as of uh, November of last year. The good news is in Quita because we are all presently surprised at the economic growth figures. And I need not repeat uh, what Secretary Carlos already said. The end of the year with a 5.6% full year, year on year growth. But what I wanted to call attention to is the fact that we have indeed a changed economy. And I'm comparing here data from October, 2019 to October, 2021. And first let's look at jobs. There was a dramatic decline in jobs between those two periods in transport and storage, accommodation and food. And of course in industry, particularly in manufacturing and construction. Where did those jobs go? Well, it turns out the displaced work, uh, the displaced workers in industry and in services massively shifted to either farming, fishing, or trading. And of course, trading being part of the services sector pushed the overall services sector still to a positive uh, overall growth. Now, if we look at the change in gross value added, which is really what we measure in GDP, we saw, of course, that agricultural output and therefore income fell slightly uh, in 2021, but industry and services declined dramatically compared to 2019. But if you look at agriculture, if you look outside of livestock, which was subject to an unusual disturbance, that is African swine fever, it was the, uh, the pandemic uh, for swine, just like our own COVID pandemic for humans. Well, uh, agriculture actually showed significant growth and I'll show you that in a while. But in terms of change in jobs again, the quality of jobs obviously has suffered. Why? Because there has been a 2.8, uh, almost 2.9 million gain in workers who are working less than 40 hours a week. In other words, part-time. But a 2.3 million decline in people who are working 40 hours or more per week. So the informal sector work is likely to be the dominant uh, kind of work now. Further, uh, 
uh, manifestations of the change, we are actually seeing lower productivity in wholesale and retail trade, which as we saw, absorb a lot of the jobs. And this is reflected in the fact that, again, in spite of 1.15 million more workers, it actually saw a drop between 2019 and 2021 of 68.3 billion. And this is in real or uh, constant prices, 2018 prices. So it does not factor in uh, inflation. Manufacturing, however, is good news. It's again growing faster than GDP, although it's not quite recovered its level in 2019. And the contribution to overall GDP has been, uh, has been rising. It's back up to 19.2%. Now, agri-fishery agri -fishery and forestry, the share of GDP has gone up from 9.2 to 9.6%. In fact, in 2020, it was 10.2% because of the abnormal decline in services and industry. But in services, the fastest growing industries have been health services, education services, and of course, information and communication services. Now, let me go into the key directions. And I summarize this into three succinct points. First, put people first. And what this really means is health, nutrition, and education are critical and urgent. Secretary Carlos already pointed this out. Well, we, we perhaps many of us have seen these SWS charts on how poverty had actually reached a point that only 16% considered themselves non-poor at the height of the pandemic. And hunger had more than doubled from 2019 levels uh, to about 21.1%. And the reason that's bad news is because we have this ongoing epidemic of stunting or severe malnutrition, especially in young children, which has long-term impacts. In fact, the problem here is that we all know that 90% of brain development occurs before age five. And after five, it's only the remaining 10% that happens. And so we have already seen the, the, the impacts of all of this from past stunting. The traditionally high stunting rates, which were up to 44.5% in 1989, is now is instrumental in the kind of productivity levels we are seeing today. And in fact, there's a study that showed that we have the lowest average IQ in the ASEAN. And I can't help suspecting that stunting and malnutrition have a lot to do with that. So this continues to threaten the quality of our future workforce. And I often say that the so-called demographic sweet spot could well be a demographic time bomb. If one out of three, and that's how many children there are who are stunted today, are going to be the people in the workforce 20, 30 years from now. Now, the other crisis in education, perhaps most of us have heard about the PISA or the Program for International Assessment of Students. Uh, I don't know what's happening, sorry. Okay. Uh, Philippines ranks lowest, in fact, in uh, reading and second lowest in math and science. And here's a, it's a zoom of the bottom of that chart. Uh, we're in that dubious distinction of being with the Dominican Republic at the bottom of this whole chart. Of course, this received wide attention when it first came out. And worse, during the pandemic, education was pushed even farther back. The learning was compromised by the prolonged school closure and Secretary Carl showed that chart where we are, we're the only ones who had that continuing closure all through those uh, months and two years already. And children of poor families in remote areas uh, uh, actually had no access to connectivity and therefore were left out of this remote learning exercise. And so the effect of these lost years will be felt years from now in terms of reduced worker productivity. Now, this is the chart that the uh, Philippine Business for Education has been showing to elaborate on this crisis. And let me zoom a little bit more on that. So you can see some of the numbers there that are really, truly alarming. So what are the imperatives? Well, as I said, put people first. First, upgrade the public health system. We need to widen and improve access to health services in our people. And that means universal health care, clean up fill health, and upgrade our testing, tracing, and vaccination capabilities. Second is strengthen food systems and therefore food security and change our food security strategy to stress food accessibility and affordability. Uh, food is useless if it's there, but we cannot afford it. So we have to adopt an open trade policy with effective productivity support to our farmers so they can compete. And of course, we should sustain the multi-sectoral zero hunger campaign that we heard from uh, Secretary Nograles in MAP some time back. So that means scaling up the first 1,000 days programs that are already there, 
And look at the example of Belo Horizonte and Belo Horizonte in Brazil. And I invite you to Google Belo Horizonte and you'll see what I'm talking about. And the third is to mobilize a new multi-sectoral education commission that will really plot our agenda moving forward for improving education. And this time it better be built on institutional reform and informed by new education science. And you know, we can simply copy very good models uh, overseas, especially Finland and other models. So we should not be squeamish about copying other countries in doing things right. Second, copy our neighbors. And here I really refer to agriculture, which I submit is, has shown that it is the backbone of the Philippine economy. And why do we know that? Well, in spite of the decrease, very slight decrease in agriculture output, it was really because of the unusual effect of African swine fever and natural calamities. If we look more closely at how agriculture fared, you can see that even through the 2020 uh, quarters, and I, I only had the fourth quarter here, there were actually a lot of blues, meaning positive growth in specific crop sectors. And in fact, rice has been growing significantly positively in spite of the rice tarification law, which some doomsayers said would kill the industry. Now we actually saw that it was just livestock, which went down by double digits, which if not for that, and if we exclude livestock from the computation, agriculture actually grew by 2.4%. And that's why I have so much faith in the resilience and the potential of agriculture. It is now, by the way, the single biggest, single provider of jobs in the economy. Just in 2020, it was uh, in a tie with wholesale and retail trade, but now it has actually about almost 25% of all the jobs being contributed by that sector. So it is a very important sector. And again, you will notice where those uh, the jobs uh, contribution has declined. So accommodation and food services, transport, and even manufacturing. Also, agriculture is most geographically prevalent. Just look at these three pie charts of contributions to agriculture, industry, and services. And you can see how in industry and services, they're all skewed towards Metro Manila, Calabar Zone, and Central Luzon. But it's much more evenly distributed across the country. All of the regions are contributing almost equitably to the agricultural uh, sector of our, uh, country, of our economy. So what's the imperative? Here is, I shamelessly say, copy our neighbors. And we seem to be so uh, averse to copying good practices being done by our neighbors. Just look at the first, the first point I make. It is look beyond the farm gate. Look at the entire value chain for agriculture. And let's get away from that past where if, uh, if something was about beyond the farm gate, the Department of Agriculture would say, oh, that's not our problem. That's the Department of Trade and Industries problem. But look at Malaysia, they've called their Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industries. Vietnam calls it Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, allowing them to look at a much broader value chain of agriculture. Now we also have to cluster and consolidate the farm management of so many small farms. And we all know the average farm size in the Philippines is just about one hectare, but they can actually get higher value adding uh, to achieve scale economies if they are clustered together. And we need only copy the examples in our neighbors again. In Thailand, cooperatives and contract growing are very, very important and instrumental. And look, their ministry is called Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives. We need to finance the small farmers amply and we could use FinTech, which is now emerging now. I've, I've heard of uh, initiatives for crowdfunding farmers. And look, the, Thailand has a bank of agriculture and agricultural co-ops, which by the way, is constantly recapitalized by the government, meaning it's recognized that they must lose money to be effective. Here, we expect our land bank to be profitable and contribute to the national treasury. Next, let provinces lead. We have devolution, but we sort of botched it when we allowed all the municipal uh, agricultural officers to their own devices. But, Look at Vietnam and Indonesia, they've done the pollution quite well. And now there's a pilot program of province-led agriculture and fisheries extension in the DA. I hope it will be sustained and further uh, escalated by the next administration. And finally, we have to raise our agriculture budget to the norm that our neighbors again have set. Let's copy them here. We only have 1.7% of our budget going to agriculture. Indonesia is 3.4, Thailand 3.6, Vietnam 6.5. 
But of course, we have to fix the absorptive capacity of the VA to get all that budget in. And that one way to do that is channel the funds through the provinces. So finally, the third key direction, export or bust. And what that means is you know, we have to look at how to boost our income growth through looking outward, not lo being too inward looking, which has stunted our economy for far too long. Note how pathetic our export performance is compared to our neighbors. We are so down below, only double digits. Everybody else is triple digits. And this is very closely related to the way we are unable to attract foreign direct investments. This is the foreign investment stock. This is the accumulated FDI over the last 20 years, according to the data from SantanderTrade.com. And so the fact is most of our neighbors exports who are doing a lot more than us in, in exports are actually coming from foreign firms, FDI. But look, it had been going down continuously from 2017 when we peaked at 10.3 billion. Luckily, we were able to recover a bit in 2021, although not still recovering where we were even in 2019. So what do we need to do? Well, we have to break out of this vicious cycle of a limited internal market leading to constrained economic growth and therefore low average income and high poverty, leading again to a limited interna internal market. That's why we have to break out of that and look to overseas markets for our potential for economic growth and raising incomes. Now, right now there's a Philippine export development plan for the next five or six years being crafted. And I happen to be directly involved because our company Brain Trust Inc was uh, engaged by the Department of Trade and Industry to facilitate this. We have to be much more ambitious and more aggressive in planning for our exports in the years ahead. And we, we need to copy what our neighbors did again, especially in agricultural exports, where we are again, pathetically so behind with only 5 billion annual earnings from farm exports, when our neighbors are doing 15 to 60 billion from the same kinds of exports. So we must also participate actively in the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and other trade agreements, bilateral or multilateral, uh, multilateral coming our way because that's the way to tap wider market opportunities, wider scope for growth, to diversify our exports in terms of both products and as well as market destinations. So lastly, what are the projections? Well, IMF says that emerging economies will grow 4.8% on the average in the coming year. We will definitely beat this, and I think we can be sure about that. Let me show you uh, a peek at the Axineo uh, econometric model projections. Well, the key number is the one encircled there. Next year, our model sees 6.4. And I must tell you that our batting average has been excellent. Look at our forecast for Q4 and the full year. We were just 0.1 percentage points uh, away from the actual. So in summary, in terms of PITIC, inflation will remain steady at 4 to 5%. Job, uh, job generation, employment of 93 to 94, or a 6 to 7% unemployment. And GDP growth, as I said, within six to seven percent, with the election stimulus uh, providing a little bit of a push there. So let me just end with a quote from Dr. Jerry Seacott in his article the other day, where he says the main responsibility for implementing the recent important reforms that we've seen will lie on the lap of the next president. And so while it's likely that there will be many opponents who will try to reverse all of that, the next president will have to be fortified with good leadership qualities to overcome this challenge to continuity. Thank you very much. For, uh, see you all. In the Thank you answer. very much, Dr. Shill. We now move on to our final speaker. Please welcome the senior economist of the World Bank in the Philippines, Dr. Rong Kian. Dr. Rong? Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to the MAP economic briefing. Uh, my colleague will share the presentation. Um, my discussion will be focused on the global economic uh, outlook and risk and won't elaborate too much on the domestic front since uh, Secretary Carl and Dr. Seal elaborate quite uh, comprehensively. Next, please. So uh, similar to the forecast by the IMF, the World Bank projects that 2022, the economy will decelerate from 5.5% in 2021 to 4.1% and 3.2% in 2023. 
reflecting the continued COVID-19 flare, higher food and energy prices, diminished fiscal support, and sustained supply disruptions. Excuse now, me, David. Excuse me, David. I think the slides are not in presentation format. Please put it in the slideshow. Click on slideshow, please. Just click on there. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So focusing on East Asia and Pacific, the growth is projected to slow down to 5.2% in average between 2022 and 2023, reflecting a slowdown of China. The region is expected to face a steady decline in global demand as growth in major economies moderate. Growth in the Philippines is projected to, um, to grow at 5.9% in 2022, supported by a sustained public investment and recovery household consumption, and moderate to 5.7% in 2023. This forecast might be re revised in April, given the January surge of COVID cases and the impact of that in that affected many touristic sites. Now, let's, let's uh, look at the, the unequal recovery pace across the world. Well, the, growth economy, uh, the global economy is expected to recover in the medium term, the path of recovery is quite uneven. The red uh, bar in the left, uh, left hand uh, figure is the world, which means that by, in, uh, in, by end of 2023, the world economy will be still below the pre-pandemic level with advanced economy already recovered, but the rest of the world is still below pandemic. And this is partly because of the scar that many of the emerging and developing countries experienced during the pandemic and also their lower vaccination rate and more persistent scarring from the pandemic that affected human and physical capital. The outlook is further dampened by the withdrawal of macroeconomic policy support, including the removal of fiscal support in more than 80% of the emerging and developing economies. Elevated inflation and tight monetary policy are expected to weigh on private consumption, while the less expected favorable ex environment for developing economy will also play a role to their investment and, and growth projections. Next, please. Now, we in the World Bank, we, we uh, pay co close attention to poverty and inequality. The pandemic has increased the number of poor in many countries, especially in the low income country, the LICs. The left figure show you the simulation of change in extreme poverty with and without COVID. Without COVID, the global poverty rate was expected to decline substantially for both emerging economy and low income country. But with COVID, the number of poor have increased substantially. And on the red panel, it show you that the pandemic also increased the between country inequality so much that the inequality across country have returned to the level of early 2010. And in this respect, this pandemic triggered global recession differ from the 2009 pandemic. In 2009, between country inequality actually declined because the emerging and developing countries growth remained resilient and the median income rose more than the advanced economy median income. Moreover, the pandemic increased within country inequality in 2020. This is caused by job loss and income loss that affected the poor more than the, uh, the well-off. Informal workers, women, low-skilled workers have higher probability of suffering income loss. And this higher inequality may have a long-term consequence if not addressed. Following the substantial growth rebound in 2021, the global outcome continue to be highly uncertain with multiple risks to growth tilted to the downside to the extent that some emerging economies might face a hard landing. The Omicron-driven pandemic resurgence could overwhelm the health system and trigger the simultaneous imposition of additional pandemic control measure across the globe. This measure could in turn aggravate supply bottlenecks, raise actual and expected inflation, and force an earlier and sharper tightening of monetary policy in many economies. This headwind to global growth could also trigger 
and be compounded by natural disasters and climate change and can also exacerbated by the financial stress given the public and the private sector balance sheet vulnerabilities. As emerging economies have less uh, policy space to provide additional support if needed, this downside risk heightened the possibility of a hard landing. By this, I mean a much sharper slowdown in growth than currently envisioned over the forecast horizon. In the long run, the global economy faced the risk of a more pronounced softening of the fundamental driver of growth. The risk is especially acute in emerging economy as their economic recovery is weaker, particularly the weakness in investment and dislocation of job and education may well lead to a more severe scarring of potential output. Moreover, subdued demand and tightening financial condition can weigh heavily on business confidence, further depressing investment and preventing productivity growth by reducing the willingness to adopt new technologies. Some of these risks can, are also interconnected. For example, global inflation surprised continuously to the upside in recent months caused by the rebound in global demand and activity together with supply disruption and rising food and energy prices. While financial conditions and advanced economy have remained accommodative, emerging economy financing conditions have tightened in recent months. For example, in some large countries such as Brazil, Mexico, and Russia, their central bank have tightened their policy rate to address rising inflation and currency depreciations. In many countries, the government bond yield have increased and credit spread have widened. So the risk of a further increase in commodity prices, continued global demand for goods coupled with more persistent supply constraint exacerbated by the Omicron wave could add to global inflation pressures. And a prolonged period of upward surprise to inflation could cause consumer and firms to reassess their inflation expectations. If inflation expectations rise above central bank objective, they could lead to a potentially sharp address, adjustment of monetary policy, causing a sudden rise in borrowing costs for the, for the government and for the private sector. Now, let me summarize the policy priority from our global report. Countries need to find a way to ensure resilient, inclusive, and green growth. So how do we do that? First priority is continue to control the pandemic through equitable access to vaccine and reduce the threat of new variants. Second, communicating policy to ensure macroeconomic stability is crucial in time of heightened uncertainty. Most of the country have resorted to debt to finance the cost of managing the pandemic, leading to a higher debt levels. Going forward, policy space will be limited. Therefore, there's need to bolster domestic revenue mobilization to rebuild fiscal buffer while supporting vulnerable groups to avoid further increase in within country inequality. In the medium term, countries need to enhance crisis prevention, preparation, and response, especially to safeguard the human capital. This is to ensure access to health services, education, and social assistance to the poor and vulnerable. Now, let me conclude my presentation with the World Bank view on policy priority for the Philippines in the medium term, given the global context. First, remedy the scar and prevent further erosion to human capital. Both Secretary Kao and Dr. Xie has elaborated uh, extensively on this, so I, I won't discuss much. Second is to leverage private sector development to drive in innovation and growth. Fiscal space is expected to be limited for all countries, including the Philippines. So private sector will play an even more important role to drive growth going forward. Secretary Kao rightly emphasized the need to increase productivity growth and innovation plays a key role. In addition, there's need to improve access to finance, especially for SMEs, by improving credit information system, enabling digitalization of MSE data, and expanding the movable collateral registry. FinTech companies have entered the Philippines for the space of the SME finance. However, the low digital adoption by SMEs prevent challenges, present challenges to FinTechs, which rely on data in a digital format. Also, SME adoption, digital adoption will facilitate the technology diffusion and expand e-commerce further uh, beyond the pandemic. Finally, preserve macro fundamentals. 
The Philippines entered the pandemic with ample fiscal and monetary buffers, which allowed the government to respond quickly at the onset of the pandemic. The combination of economic contraction and additional spending on health and social assistance lead to a substantial increase in debt level from around 40% before the pandemic to over 60% in 2021. To regain policy space, the government will need to start a gradual fiscal consolidation process. We know from past experience of rapid debt accumulation, countries will need to use a combination of revenue and expenditure measure to reduce the debt to GDP ratio. Relying on growth alone will not be enough. At the same time, the pace of consolidation needs to be carefully studied, as a too fast consolidation might slow down growth, which will be counterproductive to reduce debt to GDP ratio. Too slow, it will dampen confidence on government's commitment to consolidate, while the higher interest payment will prevent productive investment. So just give some option of uh, uh, some idea of option for fiscal consolidation. From the revenue side, there's three buckets of policy options. New taxes, higher taxes of existing taxes, and expanding the base, which means collect better through tax administration measures. On the expenditure side, there's two group of actions. Those that improve what we economists call allocative efficiency, which means the government spend less in one area that produce less jobs and growth to spend more in other areas, such as education. Then the second set are the action to increase what we call technical efficiency, which means to get the same outcome with less resources, which means spend better. For example, the procurement practice that the World Bank has found that can yield large savings to the national government. Another example is the public investment management for infra projects with better project preparation, better design that are more cost effective can save the resources and to achieve the same outcome. As you can see, the combination of policy to achieve fiscal consolidation is quite large. Finding the right mix to achieve the inclusive growth agenda need to be priority for the next government and communicated well with the public. Monetary policy has been re responsive and supportive of the economy during the pandemic. Going forward, closely monitor the pace of global recovery and inflation will inform BSP to continue some monetary policy that keeps the domestic inflation within target while supportive of growth. Let me conclude by saying that the global output outlook is positive, but the road ahead might be bumpy. The pandemic has eroded human capital, policy space, and it still creates enormous uncertainty for the business. Yet with the right combination of policy, it is possible to grow back in a resilient and inclusive manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rong. Let me now call back, uh, well, Please, Dr. Rong, stay, uh, stay where you are. We'll have Dr. Shell back and uh, hopefully Secretary Carl. Uh, we will now proceed with our Q&A and let me call on our moderator, an equally esteemed economist and whose newspaper columns and opinion pieces we always eagerly await and read religiously. One of our very own, our MAP governor and assistant treasurer and uh, the managing director of Lazaro Bernardo II and Associates, Romy Bernardo. Romy, the you. floor's yours. Uh, thank you so much, Malu. Uh, as I was listening to our speakers, I just so fervently wish that the national candidates and their teams were listening because clearly uh, they've covered the ground on what needs to be done, what the problems are. And, and uh, um, I had a number of questions earlier, but. I, upon looking at them now, I see that they've really been well covered. So may, maybe I'll just zoom in on a few questions uh, on, on some, some detail. Uh, uh, let me start by using as a takeoff point uh, something that uh, Dr. Shell mentioned about um, the quality of jobs that have really been declining. And uh, the, the, the real answer, therefore, to that would be more investments, uh, quality investments. Uh, there have been uh, a number of very forward-looking reforms that the, this administration is doing. It is trying to do up to the last minute. I refer in particular to the CREATE law. I refer to the 
uh, retail trade uh, liberalization, the foreign investment liberalization, the PSA amendment, uh, which has passed through both houses of Congress is awaiting the president's signature. Um, so the, 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 the hope is that this will help bring in uh, FDIs, which we need so badly. Uh, what else do we need to do in order to, 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 to get into the um, um, radar screen of, uh, of investors uh, and improve our competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis our neighbors? Uh, uh, by the way, excuse me, I, I recognize uh, Under Secretary Rose de Leon. I understand that uh, Secretary Carl might have some connectivity problems. He's traveling in Romblon. So uh, uh, if, if we cannot get her, him, thank you, uh, Yosek uh, Rose, for joining us. Uh, so, so let me start with, with, with that general question, and, and, I, and I, I would address it to, to everybody, maybe starting with Shell. Uh, thank you. He talked a lot also about opening up the economy and, and the need for, 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 for to do that to, to, to attract both trade and investment and, and jobs. Share yeah. this. Uh, thank you, Romy. And clearly, uh, in what you just said, you allude to the need precisely to, uh, to have a more open economy. Trade openness, by the way, is something we have lacked relative to our neighbors, which uh, many of us economists believe has been a major impediment to our growth potential. And so we hope that the next leader will really be, will really understand uh, the, 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 at the very least the, the, the fundamental concepts in economics and ideally one schooled in economics. And so that, uh, you know, it's some, somebody put in the chat box, you know, shall we just rely on our economic manager? Shouldn't it be the president himself or herself who should actually lead uh, towards uh, social and economic transformation? Yes, I agree. And therefore let us choose the right president who will, who will uh, bring that kind of knowledge and understanding into the leadership of this country. So I, I believe that if we choose the right president, yes, indeed, we can have that kind of continuity. And of course, our biggest fear is that there will be a reversal. There will be attempts to reverse these very game-changing reforms. So hope, we hope that this will not happen in the next administration. Before I pass on the floor to others, I just saw a flash question that is to you, and this is to follow up on, on what you just said. Uh, Let's see. I don't. I don't see it in the Q and A. I'm, it must have been sent by a viber. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, about RCEP in the chat box. Yes, <laughs> that's it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Shell, would you like to handle that? I I know that as as MAP we've issued quite a strong statement joining the other business groups uh, on the need to uh, join ratify understand that needing to ratify RCEP sooner so we can participate and the benefits of being part of a uh, community of nations that account for 60% of global GDP and trade. Uh, but I know some members of our association are also apprehensive about the impact this might have on, on farmers in particular. Uh, would you like to address those, those questions, Shell? I know this I'd is like your area of expertise and maybe Rose can also follow up uh, since I know the NEDA has been pushing also our separatification. Well, obviously, yes, I'll, have to, I'll have to resist the temptation to speak lengthily because I could say a mouthful. <laughs> but, but really, uh, the, the main thing is that we should start looking at these trade agreements more for the opportunities and stop this uh, very defensive posture. In fact, most of the issues raised by those who are actually asking for us to either not get in or delay getting in are, are actually misplaced and already responded to by the Department of Trade and Industry. In a nutshell, we continue to have those restrictions on agricultural products that are the, the concern of the, the farm lobby. And so there will be nothing changing when we enter into RCEP. Meanwhile, we might be losing investments and exports that we are normally uh, doing with our with the RCEP member countries now. So the longer we stay out of it, we're sending a bad signal that we're vacillating and we may end up actually being uh, the victim of trade and investment diversion. You say, Cross, anything you'd like to add to that? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, on the RCEP, yes, as you, as you mentioned, we are also uh, advocating for our um, the ratification of the, uh, the RCEP. 
um, actually in 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 addition to the uh, to the trade opportunities uh, that could be made available by the RCEP, we are also looking at opportunities for innovating. Uh, and uh, like uh, like Dr. Shell has uh, has mentioned, uh, I think we really need to change our posturing with respect to these uh, negotiations. And uh, usually, our first stance is to to protect us. Uh, but uh, if you look, for instance, at um, at uh, the posturing of uh, Singapore. So as you know, Singapore is a small country, it doesn't have an agriculture sector, etc. But when they get on the on the table and then you know they assess, uh, first of all, um, you know, getting into that negotiating table, the first thing they look at is uh, you know, what are the things that I can buy from you, and then I can build, I can add value to that, and then sell it back to you. <laughs> so, so it's actually very, uh, you know, it's it's really a very um, uh, outward looking way of uh, of doing it, and uh, and we hope that that is uh, the, the the discipline that soon we will be uh, able to to adapt going forward. Um, Robbie, if I may also just add to uh, your line of questioning earlier. Uh, so, uh, so as, as you know, we have done so many um, uh, reform initiatives to do with uh, the investment side. Hopefully going forward, it will be more on the uh, human capital side. Uh, because as you know, you know, uh, there's really a lot that we, we need to do with respect to uh, improving uh, human capital, especially uh, productivity. So talking about the education sector, which is again one of the most protected sectors in the country. We're also talking about the, uh, the apprenticeship bill which we think could, could, could provide that very uh, agile, a very agile way of, uh, you know, for, for workers to gain new skills as, uh, as they come. So th these are things that uh, we will be uh, prioritizing in the near future. Thank you. Uh, th th thank you. Uh, may, may, uh, 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 you, you presented forecast for the next couple of years, which is uh, actually at a high level ranging from, I guess, uh, for government, 6 to 7%, maybe even higher. And uh, I guess the consensus level for the private sector is around 6%. Um, a, a big part of that uh, growth is really coming from a low base. Um, my, my question would be, looking more over the medium term, can you see the Philippines going back to a 6 to 7% growth that it had uh, been able to achieve uh, in, in the past uh, uh, eight to 10 years, if I'm not mistaken, before COVID happened? Uh, or are we going to revert back to a, a more long run Philippine growth rate post war of, of 4% since we've already exhausted some of the fiscal headroom? We cannot be doing BBB at the same level. There is scarring from the economy, from various reasons that uh, that I, I think uh, Dr. Wrong uh, explained, uh, and this will be true not just for us, but for emerging markets in general. What, what would be your more medium-term view on, on the Philippines, uh, and 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 to what extent will I guess the uh, the quality of governance and and policies will define will define what that growth rate should be. Anyone cares to go go first? Uh, no, I'll defer to Yusek Rose, perhaps, on, in terms of the government's outlook. Yeah, of course, I'm from government, and so I'm very optimistic. We will get to <laughs> where we want to go. No, no, no. Uh, but seriously, uh, what we're seeing here is that uh, you know, unlike uh, unlike previous disasters, etc., there was not really any erosion of physical capital. So as soon as we are able to uh, get this uh, pandemic, you know, uh, really uh, at a manageable level, probably. Uh, we, we already uh, believe that uh, you know it will not go away, but we really have to do better in terms of uh, managing this risk. So if we're able to do that, then uh, uh, and uh, as you know, even during this pandemic, we were working hard on putting in the reforms, the foundational reforms that will actually enable us to build even more capacity. So given that uh, capacity, I think what is next for us is really to be able to um, make our workforce ready 
to to be able to consume this additional capacity so uh, so so that's that's really uh, the important next step here thank you Well, in my case, let me just say that uh, I think the reason why the IMF and the World Bank are projecting slower growth in the next couple of years, at least, is precisely because of the global environment, especially the US economy, which is obviously in some kind of trouble right now with very high rates of inflation. And of course, the anticipated moves of the Federal Reserve Bank, which will, of course, ripple on to the rest of us. No? And uh, I, I saw the, the comment of Secretary Bobby Di Ocampo about when the U.S. sneezes, uh, everybody else catches pneumonia, and that could very well be. And I think we have to really factor in that risk as well. But having said that, I think the Philippines has this innate capability to grow much faster than it has shown in the past years. Agriculture alone, my favorite, because you know I've shown how it's really the backbone, has so great potential, has much scope for further growth if only we would have a much more outward looking orientation in this sector. So we can grow on the fact that, you know, we have a large segment of uh, internal demand propping up our economy, driving our economy. And that's why we were also less affected by these global disturbances uh, in, in these two instances in the past. But you know, now is the time, of course, to tap that potential for growth from the world markets, which will be subject to these threats because of the, uh, hiccups or maybe more than hiccups that the U.S. economy is now experiencing. Uh, Rong, would you like to... Uh... Yes, maybe I, I would just add that the Philippines has been experiencing fast growth for the last 15, 20 years, and a lot of that is uh, productivity growth. And as we know from the global experience, productivity growth tend to slow down if there's no new reforms. So to go back to 6%, we need to implement those structural reforms. That this, uh, rightly said by Yusek Rose, has passed many of those uh, reforms. So, so the next administration need to implement those and continue those reforms that started this uh, government so we can continue to have the high productivity growth uh, to grow at 6 7%. Yeah, I would just mention the structure yeah. reform that is needed for, for that. <laughs> Ronnie, uh, Ronnie, yeah. Secretary yes. Carl is logged in. Uh, we were just Secretary Carl. Yes, that is already. Uh, Secretary Carl, th thank you for joining us again. Uh, and uh, uh, your USEC, Dr. Rose, is kind enough to join. Is your connection uh, good enough? I, I have some more personal questions for you. Uh, if, 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 if you're if you're game. Uh, sorry, Sir Romy, the call just dropped again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have plugged to him. Uh, so, uh, I, we'll try to get him back on. Uh, okay, I, I promise not to ask political questions. Okay. You scared uh, him off. <laughs> he can come back in. He can come back in. Uh, let, let, let me continue on, 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 on the uh, certain line of questioning. Uh, yeah, the, you mentioned the, uh, and, and thank you, Malu, I think you were the one who mentioned it, uh, the era of cheap money might be over. And uh, we've seen a lot of cheap money uh, since the, 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 the one of the key requirements of solving the global financial crisis was central banking needed to be reinvented. And, and we're seeing that, but at, at some point, uh, and the US Fed is seeing it already, it will probably need to uh, do a quick pivot um, now, this, this, uh, it's already been observed that this would have some impact, not just uh, on, 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 uh, on us, but many of the emerging markets. Uh, uh, should we worry about what this might mean uh, to us uh, and, uh, in terms of interest rates, uh, exchange rate, capital flight? Um, what might we do to protect ourselves? Should, should the central bank be raising the policy rate even though uh, our inflation, I think for the first time, Shell, you, you, you please remind me, this is the first time I've ever seen U.S. inflation being higher than ours. And, and if, now, uh, on the other hand, we're, we, 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 uh, we have uh, very comfortable reserves, so we can actually uh, allow our reserves to be drawn back a little and allow some depreciation uh, and, 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 and give emphasis to growth. Uh, how, how should the Philippines be positioning, given all of this uh, uh, 
you know, somewhat sometimes conflicting objectives and very dynamic uh, developments uh, uh, all over the world uh, and how people might respond to them. Thank you. Ladies first. Hello. 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 Yes. Okay, uh, so this is a very pertinent question, given that uh, we, we saw that Fed already announced that many other countries' policy make, uh, monetary authority has announced. Fortunately, the Philippines is uh, in ASEAN is less integrated to the international financial market than Thailand and Indonesia. So we don't rely too much uh, relatively to other countries on international capital flow. So in that sense, we are less um, affected by the interest rate. However, the, I, I personally believe that the, the inflation hasn't picked up in the Philippines because the demand was depressed, right? So in the, in the, um, in the US, the demand picked up fa much faster, coupled with the supply chain constraint, mm -hmm. it, it drive the inflation and the monetary policy. But in the Philippines, because the demand side has been depressed, so the inflation didn't reach to the level that we expected in other countries. But now that we are recovering, we need to be more closely monitor the global inflation and how that translates to the domestic inflation. So um, it's true that we are less affected, but still higher Fed policy rates will affect the Philippine Monetary Authority um, um, uh, we are room. So I, I think uh, recently BSP governor has said that we need to be evidence-based policy response. That is exactly right. So it's very difficult to say exactly what they should do when the Fed increase. Uh, we need to monitor the economic recovery and the path through from the global inflation to the domestic inflation. But uh, I'm very confident that the BSP will manage very well the mm -hmm. When we need to make a decision. Well, our central bank governor has just been awarded the Global Central Bank uh, of the Year, and I'm sure it is a tribute just to not to him, as he said, but to the entire institution and the monetary board. Uh, anything to add to what uh, Dr. Rong said, uh, uh, Dr. Shell, Dr. Rose? Uh, Teddy is back in. I'm sorry. Secretary Carl seems to Secretary be. Carl is back in. Hi, Secretary Carl. Or Malu, if you want to comment on that question, I know you are a very close follower of financial developments as a chairman of your institution. Or maybe Secretary Carl might want to say anything on that. No. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> okay. Uh, let, let, me, let me try to move into some of the questions. In the QA, I see a lot, a number of them. Sorry. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, shouldn't corruption be a priority in the economic agenda? How much of our national budget is wasted due to corruption? Uh, would anyone want to uh, answer this? Maybe in part, uh, this can be answered by the question, by the presentation of. Secretary Carl on digitalization of the economy. A lot of the problems of corruption are because there's very little visibility and real time uh, processing of transactions uh, uh, and, and exchange of money. Uh, the, the, but, but, but maybe any, anyone would, would care to answer that. Uh, there is also, uh, I think, some related questions. I might as well exhaust, exhaust that. Uh, uh, no, I think that's the only question related to corruption. A anyone care to answer that? Yeah, um, Rami? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. So th that is actually part of, uh, that's actually chapter five of the Philippine Development Plan, where um, the, um, the uh, outcome objective is the desired outcome is uh, for uh, clean, fair, efficient and people-centered governance. So uh, the having an e-government is actually part of it. And uh, also included that are reforms where actually uh, a number of them have already been passed and enacted into law, like the, uh, the, the law that uh, created the ARTA, the Anti-Red Tape Authority, and of course the Filsis Act. Uh, 
So these two things actually go together. So if we can have more of this uh, of this digital government, the e-government, and of course you have that uh, the, the ARTA that uh, really requires all of us to come up with uh, with streamlining all the processes, simplifying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, and and right now we're actually more into uh, you know having more of the online transactions. So this will actually um, uh, lend itself to to do greater scrutiny so there will be more accountability and and we hope that is uh, you know really the way to go in order to address this corruption thank you um there's a question from uh former secretary of finance bobby diocampo given the seemingly turbulent state of the u.s economy and, and saying uh, i see i think we've covered that there's a question from the president of ei bobby castillo Shell Habitor raised a very serious problem of population that is sorry, uh, mentally challenged due to malnutrition. Since we do not really attract a lot of FDIs who generate manufactured exports, might we be better off focusing our efforts and finances to support farmers, fishermen, and small traders who can move up the economy more, keep our food security assured, and improve the lives of the greater majority of our people. Uh, no. would, would Shell, yeah, please. Indeed, I, I mean, we should have done so long, long ago, rather than uh, help our farmers, uh, thinking, helping our farmers by shielding them from competition, thinking that was the best way to help them. That only stunted our agriculture sector. That's what I've been maintaining all of these years. And so indeed, I agree, we should help our farmers the right way. And that is precisely to help them boost their productivity and therefore their incomes so they can be competitive in an environment of trade openness and not have to be blocking every uh, trade agreement that comes our way on, the, on, the, on a very defensive note. So as I said, let us, let us do that support for our farmers the right way this time by a genuine uh, assistance to improve their productivity and their competitiveness. Let's stop doing it by shielding them from competition. We have to ease away the, that shield so that we can actually grow up and become mm -hmm. more competitive. And by the way, government has been part of that complacency that was the result of the shielding from competition. Thank you, Dr. Shell. This one from uh, MAP Agriculture uh, Committee Chairman, Oscar Toralba, who used to be head of uh, Philippine Coconut Administration on infrastructure regional inequity, how will NEDA rate and rank priorities so that regions or provinces who have less will get their infra? Uh, I, I guess this is for Rose. Uh, for maybe me. the IRA and the Mandanas decision is that's quite one. relevant here. Would you like to talk mm -hmm. about that? Yes, Thank you. yes, that's yeah, that, that's one that will actually provide the you know some equity. But uh, another thing that is uh, actually it was also said, Carl, who will be who is proposing this reform with respect to the project appraisal process, that we should also include you know two crucial pr parameters. Uh, one is uh, an equality parameter. Another is uh, sustainability parameter. So even as we compute for the EIRR, the FIRR, <laughs> we should also still include, uh, you know, as part of the evaluation process, those two things. Will it promote regional equity? And next is, will it uh, promote sustainable? Is it sustainable? So, so those two things. So we think that, uh, uh, you know, again, this is uh, within the purview, direct purview of, of the NEDA, and we hope that that will also go a long way in uh, improving regional equity. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, there is a question from Rex Drilon. Uh, sorry. We agree climate change focus is crucial but just as urgent is addressing the serious problems of inequity and exclusion, particularly poverty and hunger. What will you hand over the next administration in these areas? I guess, uh, uh, I think that's been covered in the presentation of Secretary Carl and, uh, and uh, also Shell. And, uh, but uh, would you like to add more, I, I, I guess, to 
to answer Rex's question, uh, uh, Yusek Rose. Yeah, I, I guess just to say that it doesn't have to be an either or. <laughs> so we're really looking towards, uh, you know, improving, uh, uh, addressing regional uh, inequity. And uh, part of the, um, uh, the ways forward is really to address also the uh, uh, poverty, uh, the difference, uh, the differing poverty across the regions. And again, part of that is really because, uh, you know, there's not much development in the area. So like I said, it doesn't have to be an either or. We know about that nexus, that uh, poverty, growth, and inequality nexus. And uh, we should actually, uh, you know, address really all of them. Thank you. Any, anyone else uh, would like to comment on that? Incidentally, I guess there is a cool question of balancing uh, the, what, what they call the energy trilemma. Even as you try to do more in terms of renewable energy, we have to be mindful that it does not compromise either the affordability or security of energy, which impacts on especially the, the poorest. We have to be able to create jobs for the poorest, and you need secure energy for that. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry to editorialize. Uh, uh, anyone else? I, I see our president, uh, President Fred. May, maybe a question that might you might want to add to. Uh, as we, as the fiscal headroom shrunk from uh, what we, we used to have uh, only a forty percent public debt to GDP ratio, it's now sixty percent of GDP. Uh, it's twenty basis points. It's uh, it's an amazing leap. There will be less room for BBB. I don't know. Can we still do? Five to six percent of BBB, five to six percent of GDP of BBB. Uh, Secretary Rose, uh, Secretary Carl. Uh, number uh, uh, number two, uh, if, how much reliance on PPP is potentially possible, and what changes in policy might be necessary in order to encourage more uh, PPP. Uh, we happen to have uh, the ADB expert on PPP who did that for over a decade. Uh, President Fred, would you like to also comment on that? <laughs> for starters. Uh, well, firstly, the government has to do the planning and identify the projects that will be proposed for PPP arrangements. Uh, we should not approach PPP the way it has been done here, which is to wait for the private sector to make proposals. Uh, that's a wrong way of uh, making full use of PPP. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but we are where we are. Uh, I don't know, has, has, you say, Rose, has government already prepared a full pipeline of PPP projects that are uh, possible to bid out on a competitive basis? Uh, I'm not the competent authority to answer that. I don't know. Sec Carl, are you already able to come in? Can you hear me, Romy? Hi, yes. Sec. Hi, Sec Tari. Salamat. You can hear me? Uh, we hear you. We don't see you. But, but we, yeah, we, we, we the, know how you, Yeah, go ahead. In the mountains in Romblon. <laughs> can you hear me well? I, yeah, we hear you well. Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, there are several uh, PPP projects on the table, like the hospitals, uh, the road IT project. So these are being processed, but uh, it is really the line agencies who have to uh, prepare very well these projects. So it is not NEDA who is implementing these projects. We are the independent evaluator to ensure that these projects are prepared well. They address uh, very important issues. They are they do not add to our contingent liabilities, and so these these are what Neda is looking for. Uh, in the next admin, I think uh, this is something that should be uh, considered given the limited headroom. Uh, but within the budget, there are ways also to reallocate and prioritize. So everything right now is about reprioritizing where we will get the highest return whether it be in infra or education or health. So, so that, that is really how uh, we should uh, work on this uh, uh, financing program for infra, whether it is the budget uh, or the ODA, local fund or PPPs. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm, 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 yeah, we're out here. of time. Just time check. Time, we have yes. time for one more question. Uh, uh, I, I, can, go ahead. Can you go ahead. The tax or the question on the wealth tax? Uh, yes. Let Let's see. Uh, any any thoughts? Uh, given that we will be having some fiscal challenges, as uh, as uh, Doctor Wrong told us, would would uh, th there's been some talk of uh, wealth tax, including by some presidential candidates? Uh, is this something we should be looking at in the Philippines, uh, uh, or if, if not the wealth tax, what kind of taxes should we be looking at, if at all? I'll try that, Romy. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. You know, if the wealth uh, is fixed, then uh, we should at least uh, tax it equitably. And there is package three of the tax reform that uh, properly evaluates okay. real properties. Yeah. <laughs> but if yeah. the wealth can run away, then that's not how we should do it. And we have package four, the PIFITA, which harmonizes the taxes. Uh, so that uh, they are all treated fairly. So th and that's how I think uh, uh, we should look into this wealth tax. Thank you. It's, a, it's an excellent answer. I, I don't know if anybody would like to answer that. I, I'm tempted to ask you, Secretary Carl, under what conditions would you consider continuing to serve in government? But I, I, will, not, I will not press you. Uh, my uh, answer is uh, there is a time for everything. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay, maybe uh, just one last question, if you will allow me. Uh, you've heard some of the platforms of the uh, presidential candidates. What are the one, two, or three things that you would advise that they not do? Uh, I, I know there, there is a lot of temptation to, to do populist uh, promises, but what would you highlight that they should not do, even if it's uh, popular? For everybody, I can ask all of the speakers, please. Yeah, well, I, I, I hope uh, their economic advisors would uh, be known so that we could have a more, uh, more engaging discussion to understand and to also share what the administration has done. And my thinking is we have a very strong track record of managing the economy well over three administrations. And that should continue. That should not be reversed. The prudent, disciplined management of fiscal resources should continue. Uh, number two, we also have a track record over six administrations to liberalize key industries, in whether in rice, in public utilities, in telecoms, airlines, fertilizers, and so on. Uh, even if they are slow to happen, they did happen over time, and that should not be reversed. Otherwise, you will have, uh, I think, uh, more challenging uh, problems that will be faced. So I think th those are the two that I, uh, among many others, that should be uh, preserved. And I ho hope we would have a chance to engage and listen and share what the administration has done, which actually builds on top of previous administration's uh, successes. And I hope the next administration will preserve and do more. Thank you. Amen. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, unless there are other question, uh, answers from anyone else, I, I like just like to thank on behalf of the governors and Malu, everyone. I, I, I think this has been a most uh, educational uh, and, and, live and engaging discussion. Thank you so much I, uh, for the privilege of moderating this, President Fred. Yeah. Uh, before I call on President Fred for his parting uh, words, uh, I've been asked to request everybody to just uh, put their best smile on for a photo <laughs> of. Uh, can we okay, have the <laughs> Take okay, care please. of the screenshot. Okay, one, two, three. One more time. One, two, three. Thank you. Okay, and... Uh, President Fred, for your parting words. Uh, you're muted. You're muted, uh, Fred, President Fred. Fred. I was saying, I am glad to hear that not everything is dark. Uh, there is that much pessimism. It's uh, 
possible, but uh, it's I, I hear more optimistic uh, outlook uh, for the country. Uh, and I hope uh, with the the new government will uh, listen to what Secretary Carl is saying, you know, that there are things that they should not reverse. And that's very important. I think that's my main takeaway from uh, this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers, our moderator, and thank you everybody for joining us in this very enriching afternoon. The GMM and the economic briefing is adjourned. Thank you all and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks again.